Hello, Diane Angelina. Hi, Angelina. Nice to see you. Good to and see you too. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to go ahead and welcome everyone on behalf of Dimensions and Travel. We are delighted you are joining us for our journey to uh, Spain's Basque region with Titanium Tours, one of our favorite people to work with for planning Spain trips. This is the 24th in our agency series of virtual events about exciting destinations and fun ways to see them. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Diana St. James. <coughs> Sorry. And I'm one of the owners of Dimensions and Travel along with Jill Romano. Dimensions and Travel has been in business for 42 years since 1978. And we plan to be here for a good long time after this too. We have 28 travel advisors working with us and all of us miss travel so much and uh, we know you do too. But we find these events are a great way for us to go somewhere while we wait to safely travel again. And they keep the spirit alive in all of us and we hope they do the same thing for you too. Before we get started, I want to just remind everyone we're going to put everyone in listen only mode. So your microphones are now muted and your cameras are off to minimize distractions. You can ask questions and I'm sure you may have a few. Uh, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box down at the bottom and we will um, uh, facilitate them during the presentation if we can answer them quickly. Otherwise, we'll have some time at the end to go through and, and answer your questions. And if for any reason we run out of time, our travel advisors will be getting back to you with, with answers to your questions. Well, during today's trip uh, to Spain, we wanna show you the Northern part, the Basque region with a focus on some of the food and wine experiences that you can have there. But before we get started, I would like to introduce my business partner and agency co-owner, Jill Romano. Hi, Jill. Hi, Diana. Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're so delighted to see you all today. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Jesus Repetto, who is the co-founder and CEO of Titanium Tours. Jesus was born and raised in Seville, Spain. He's a seasoned entrepreneur, dividing his time between Spain and the U.S., while leading a team of creative travel designers who help us craft custom itineraries for all of you. He is also the chairman and CEO of a healthcare nonprofit, the Cancer Hope Network, as well as a mentor for the University of San Francisco School of Business MBA students. We at Dimensions in Travel have been working with Jesus and his team since 2013 and are just thrilled he's here today to share his passion for his country. Being a longtime resident of the United States, he truly understands the level of service our clients expect and he's a firm believer in exceeding those expectations. In 2019, his company was awarded the Ensemble Travel Group's on Location Partner of the Year Award. And that was voted on by more than 800 travel agencies in North America. So big congratulations again to you, Jesus and your team. We are so looking forward to our journey with you today to the Basque Country. And if you would take us away, thank you. Awesome, but thank you, Diana and Jill. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you everybody for making time in your day. Uh, we hope to take you on a virtual tour of some very, very exciting sites. And um, well, let's, let's get on it. Let me uh, share my screen with you. Bear with me a second. Are we good? We are Diana, good. Diana, are we good? Yep, we're all set. Take it away. <laughs> Excellent. So, I just want to start by saying I'm not here to sell you an itinerary. Um, what I, I'm here to help you get out of <laughs> your homes for a little bit, get out of the barrier or wherever you may be and dream of, you know, one of the things that we all have in common is our love of, of travel. So um, like Jill said, I was born and raised in Southern Spain in, in Seville and uh, 
even though I'm from the south and very proud to be, um, I think the Basque country in the Rioja region is just um, gorgeous. So I wanna take you on a virtual tour of this fascinating area of my country. Uh, we're gonna go around this region and discover some of the best wines and sites that it has to offer. So let's turn our imagination zone and let's uh, hope and you know, I'm gonna to try to transport you to my country. So the Basque country, if I were to define it to you, I think to me it's poetic, it's country roads, it's medieval fishing villages like the one you see in this picture, it's vineyards, beaches, and it's above all things wine and some of the best food in Spain. To situate you um, geographically, it's on the northeast side of Spain, right? Touching France right there. Um, it's that area in red. And if you can see on this zoomed in um, area, it's really, it's touching France right here. So you have San Sebastian on the right, you got Bilbao on the left, uh, and you have La Rioja right down on, you know, underneath the bus country. And this is kind of what it looks like, you know, um, jagged cliffs and, and beautiful landscapes, very quaint towns with colorful buildings that are very, very different than anything else in, in the rest of Spain. You know, serene landscapes um, like this with the sheep and, and like I mentioned, the very colorful um, fishing villages. So if we were on this virtual tour, day one, I would take you first of all um, to this uh, winery, Lopez de Heredia Winery, which uh, for 131 years, four generations of this family, they've devoted themselves to producing excellent and unique wines, masterpieces. Um, and the, the, the achieve, they've achieved so, um, you know, following sort of the, the recipe of the founder, Rafael Lopez de Heredia, um, in the 19th century, what he called and defined as the Supreme Rioja. So their secret is a vineyard care, scrupulous selection of grapes, the aging in oak barrels in the heart of deep underground galleries, and then later age them in bottles. So they make exceptional um, uh, wines with a great bouquet. And you can actually find them in the US for anywhere between 40 to $60. This, for example, would be um, those casks, those barrels that they keep, you know, way underground to age um, their wines in these oak barrels. And it's, it's an impressive chairmanship. If you can imagine, you can actually walk down in these galleries and you can see this, this, this barrels where they're aging their wine. Once we would finish in this winery, we would try another winery. This one is called La Rioja Alta. Um, five families actually got together and created this winery in 1890. And their pursuit was that of quality, elegance, innovation, and evolution. And evolution is important to them, even though they respect their tradition, they've done a really good job of adapting subtly to the new taste of the new generation since then. So they have their own recipe based on their winemaking tradition and know-how. They make their own barrels and casks. They use manual racking and they believe in long aging. And they combine this with some of the most uh, modern winemaking traditions. As you can see, the barrels are buried here under this wooden surface. Um, today, their wines are an international exemplar of the great wines of Rioja. And their brands are present in some of the best restaurants all over the world. And even in the US, you can find them for anywhere between 40 and $60. So this is where we would take a stop and we would have lunch and we would enjoy some of this wine with some of the delicacies of, of this area. Now for some culture and history in the afternoon, we would visit the monastery of Cañas. This is a Cistercian Abbey. And it's one of the first that was founded in Spain. It actually dates back to the year 1170 when Don Felipe Diaz de Aro, he was the Lord of Biscay, and his wife, Doña Aldonza Ruiz de Castro, they donated this land to the Cistercian nuns in the area to establish an abbey. The construction of the monastery took a long time, was gradual, so there are three distinct stages. There's a, a Romanesque portion, which is the oldest, then there's a Gothic, Gothic uh, portion dated from the second half of the 13th century, uh, which you can kind of see in the back here, 
in the back of this temple. Uh, and then lastly, an expansion in the 16th century. So it's a really unique uh, monument because it blends a lot of different styles. Here you can see some of the porticos and some of those um, later influences of the Gothic. And then here in the courtyard, you can see some of that uh, Romanesque um, oldest uh, sections of it. To sleep, we would choose the hotel and winery in Marques de Riscal. This is actually a uh, Frank Gehry masterpiece. You know, Frank Gehry is the architect famous for creating the Guggenheim Museum in, in the US and Dubai and many other great buildings. Um, so it was created to house the hotel Marques de Riscal, which is also a pristine winery. And it has since become a highly sought after luxury retreat. Uh, it combines design, art, cuisine, wine, and the lush landscape of the, of the vineyards around it. And so they've created what they call the city of wine. And it's indeed a city because it's, you've got the hotel, you've got the winery, you've got the vineyards, you have several fine dining options, which include a Michelin star restaurant, a wine museum, and the Codely Vinotherapy Spa, which I'm gonna show you just in a minute. So the prestigious cosmetic brand uh, Codely created this Vinotherapy Spa concept for them, which offers natural treatments which contain extraordinary properties of the vine and the grape. So it's a, it's a unique moment of uh, pleasure involving all the senses. So in 1998, Marques de Rispal, they pioneered this idea of combining what is the manufacturing space with also a space for leisure, which is what the, you know, why they called it the city of wine. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the Vinotherapy uh, Spa where you could relax and enjoy this awesome treatments based on the grape and the vine. And on day two, um, we visit the winery. It's the oldest and most traditional of La Rioja. Now, if you remember, La Rioja is a different region from the Basque Country, it's right underneath it. And it was open for business in 1860. And it was notable for its pioneering, innovative, and nonconformist techniques, always a step ahead of the rest without forgetting the traditions. Their wines are incredible. And you can find them in the US from anywhere between 20 dollars in, in $90. After this winery visit, going back to our theme of mixing some history with the, the wine and the, and the surroundings, um, we have the Granja Nuestra Señora de Remeyuri, which is uh, one of the oldest vineyards in the area, ca carved into the rock. There are ancient wine presses, um, probably one of the oldest wine remains of La Rioja. The origin of this farm is lost in time. It is actually a mystery, but it has an acropolis in the center of the property, which indicates the existence of the you know, prior village in the 10th century. The farm crops here are protected by those mountains in the back from the wind and the frost, and they enjoy an exceptional microclimate. So in these environments, you know, remnants of prehistoric populations, Romans, Visigoths, Moors, and finally, this medieval settlement, they speak of it agricultural activities since ancient times. So visiting this farm is like taking a journey through time with many stops in many eras. Here's a close up to one of the buildings of this farm. Next, we would visit the Monastery of Yuso. This is an incredible site declared World Heritage by UNESCO in 1997. It's considered to be the cradle of my language, the Spanish language. And it's definitely a must-see in La Rioja. Um, look at it at the end of, the, of a valley. The Monastery of Yuso dates from the 11th century with the remodelings in the 16th and 18th century. So it's got a very eclectic mixture of, of uh, architecture and art periods. So for example, you have an equestrian sculpture of San Millan that dominates the main front of the building that it's in Baroque style, so 18th century. And then the church was actually built between the years 1504 and 1540. And they have a 12th century uh, reredos, which is like a cloth that drapes over the um, altar. And then they also have a platyrus pulpit, so in between Gothic and, and Baroque, and acquired then in Greco-Roman style. So it's such a combination 
of different periods of art that it's it's definitely um, a jewel and something to be seen. Here's some of the portico uh, where you can see the Gothic styles in the in the top of uh, the nave, and um, this is another view of that portico. So this is definitely it's definitely worth uh, seeing. On day three, we would go to a different type of winery. I love this, this setting. So this is the Bodega Soyauri with their uh, Conde de los Andes wine, which is part of what they call the Barrio de Bodegas. So it's an area with underground caves, family caves. They have three traditional buildings and a cluster of spectacular underground caves and cellars. It was excavated over several centuries. And the Conde de los Andes caves are Rioja's most impressive underground cellar system in terms of age, architecture, and dimensions. It extends over a kilometer in length, so about um, 0.60 of a mile. Uh, it's corridors for, full of history, galleries that blend in with the darkness, jaw dropping vaults, and little nooks with special magnetism. Uh, the cellar is imbued with the ancient culture of wine. Um, you can still you can find their wines in the U.S. Um, for anywhere between thirty to forty dollars, and this would be a perfect place to have lunch as well. So here's another picture of some of these caves and this underground network of caves that they created over the centuries, and you you can see how they turned these caves into cellars. You see all the bottles there, and then here's another view of that. I think this spectacular um, location, very different. Uh, very full of history and, uh, and mystique. After visiting this underground tour, we would go on a tour of the Dinastia Vivanco Museum, which is around the corner. And this museum was actually awarded by UNESCO the, uh, to be the world's best wine culture museum. Here you can see some closer pictures of some of the wine presses and some of the other you know, machinery that they use, um, you know, over the centuries to create uh, wine. On day four, we would visit Senorio de Arinzano Winery. This one is situated in the north uh, east of Spain, so closer to France. So it's between Rioja and Bordeaux, um, still on the Spanish side. And so it occupies a valley that is formed by the last slopes of the Pyrenees Mountains. And then it's divided by the winding waters of the river Ega. So it creates, you know, between the slopes of the Pyrenees and the river Ega, creates a unique microclimate, uh, which is great for vine growing. Um, it's been recognized for the excellence of his vineyard since the 11th century, when the novel Sancho Fortuñones, uh, the Arinzano, first produced wines on the property. And then in the 16th century, Mosen Lope de Ulate, which was a noble and a, a, a advisor to the king, uh, chose this state as the ideal site for the construction of his palace. Uh, their wines are, are um, got a big range, and the, but they're very select. They start at $20 and they give, I found them as far as much as $110 here in the US. Here's another picture of um, what the state looks like. Then moving on into the Basque country, we would visit the Monastery of Irache. Um, and now in Basque, you will find a lot of the times you find this T and this X, um, you pronounce it like if it was a CH. So don't, don't, don't stumble over your tongue there. It's uh, actually pretty easy. So here in this Monastery of Irache, um, it's medieval, Renaissance and Baroque styles. Uh, it's a Benedictine monastery of unknown origin, it's a mystery, but it was first documented in 958 AD. It became a landmark as a hospital for the pilgrims en route to Santiago. This is part of, so the El Camino de Santiago has several branches, so this is part of the French branch, as the French would come south and go into the, you know, all the way northwest to visit Santiago and the pilgrimage. So this was a hospital in the route, and it was declared a national monument, monument in 1887. And it's been recently restored. They've restored the cloister, the tower, and other facilities. And there have even been talks of turning it into a parador, which is, if you know, parador are uh, hotels run by the uh, Spanish government. 
Um, although unfortunately the latest recession put a stop to that, but this would be, even if we can't sleep there, we can definitely visit it and it's, it's, it's enchanting. Here's another uh, picture of one of the sides of the monastery and one off the portico. So going towards the water on day five, we would visit Hidaria. This is one of my favorite places in the bus country. Um, it's To me, it's really neat because it combines the medieval village, um, it's a fishing village with very colorful houses for the fishermen. And it creates this great contrast between the antiquity and the modern of the vibrant colors. This is home to Chacoli wine, which is a a uh, great wine, less lesser known uh, here in the US, but you can still find it. And uh, we would visit one of these uh, wi uh, wineries. This is Chomin Chinese. Um, so Chacoli, it's, it's a white wine. It's slightly sparkling. It's very, very dry. And it's only grown in this region. Um, I've been able to find it in the US, uh, you know, where I live pretty easily. And it's actually pretty affordable, 15 to $20. But anyways, so this is located in the heart of uh, Hetaria, and they've maintained a dedication to cultivating the vines and making chakoli for many, many generations. Generations. They are the uh, longest standard chakoli wine winery in the area. <clears throat> then very nearby Hetaria, for those of you, if we have any Game of Thrones fans uh, among the audience today, um, this was featured in season seven. This is the island fortress of Dragonstone. Um, that it's in reality, it's called someone the Gathelugache. And uh, Gathelugache means castle rock. So it's this island that's been connected by a man made bridge with 241 uh, steps up this zigzagging path. And the fun uh, fact is that underneath the church that you see on the top of the island, uh, there are caves that used to be uh, used by the Inquisition to imprison the so-called witches during that time. Now for a little bit of rest, we would we could visit the village of Tharuaut. And this is a beach town. It was a well hunting town for many, many years until the 16th century. And then it became a, a leisure destination after the summer stays of our queen Isabella II in the second half of the 19th century. Um, it's definitely a beach destination, but it's a laid back destination in compared to some of the more known cities like San Sebastian. And speaking of San Sebastian, San Sebastian is it's, it's beautiful. It's very, um, it's one of the largest cities in, in the Basque country. And it's, um, it's really interesting because it's very opulent and sophisticated. It's kind of like the Biarritz of Spain. Um, so white sandy beaches, uh, uh, luxurious mansions, because this became the summer home for the very wealthy uh, in Europe during the Belle Epoque. Now in San Sebastian, so we've had red wine, we've had uh, white wine and another very typical, um, you know, spirit of, of this area is cider. So outside of San Sebastian, we would visit this uh, Petit Tregui family of cider house. So this family, they had a traditional wooden press to make cider, but it was from their own farms and their own apples. Um, and it was originally just for themselves, for the family consumption, but it was so good that soon they started selling to all the, you know, regional fishing fleet and the so-called cider taverns around there. So today is, it's a perfect place to taste Basque cider in Basque cuisine. Uh, it's out in the countryside, surrounded by apple trees, but it's only like four miles outside of San Sebastian. And on day seven, we would finish this tour of the Basque country in La Rioja by visiting uh, Bilbao. And Bilbao is the new modern face of the Basque country. So it's home to the Guggenheim, which you can see there. And it's the center of the arts in the Basque country. And it's interesting because it's got a mixture of tradition and modern sophistication. And of course, when in the Basque country, you have to do a Pinchos tour. So Pinchos is a traditional um, food there in the Basque country. It's what the rest of Spain, we call tapas, 
But in the Basque country, they have this pinchos. Pincho means stick. And as you can see, there's in all the uh, little, you know, tapa sized dishes, there is a stick there. Um, I don't know if you saw, since you guys are, I'm past lunchtime here in the East Coast, but if you, you guys are almost getting there, so I want to just make you a little hungrier. So if you saw in the invitation that Diana and Jill sent, there were a couple of recipes. My favorite is this one, atuna la plancha, which is very easy to do here in the States. And, you know, you pair it with chacoli wine and it's delicious. So if you you know, maybe not today, but tomorrow, if you're thinking want to cook, that would be a great way to remember this virtual tour of Spain that you did today. Or for those of you who don't like uh, white wine, there's also a recipe for Rioja, which is a lamb stew, it's great for winter, with uh, potatoes and green olives. And actually, Diana went uh, out yesterday looking for uh, some of the wines that we featured in this presentation to see if you can find them there locally in the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, she found this Marquez de Riscal, which is outstanding uh, for $22. And then another winery that is great wine. Um, this is a Tempranillo. That's why it's, it's cheaper. So it's been, it hasn't been aged as long, uh, which is $8 a bottle. Um, then from there, we're going to start with the uh, Q&A. Ready for any questions? Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. That was incredible. And I am so glad I know how to pronounce the TX now. I think I have been avoiding <laughs> saying the word pinchos for a long time. And I, um, I feel much more confident now and can't wait to go eat some too. Well, Jill, do you want to take a look at the questions and see what we might have down there? Has anything popped up? Absolutely. Um, I did encourage everybody, if you want to pop something there in the chat box, it's at the lower bottom of your screen. Um, one of the questions that I have is, when is the tour and is the travel via bus? So I think, Jesus, if you could spend a moment to maybe explain to people the, the custom type of itineraries that you create and um, talk a little bit about the transportation, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the tours that we create are always, uh, they're custom fit. So it's going to be what you want. So typically, so we don't, we don't have group uh, departures that leave on a certain day. This would be for you, you and your friends, and it would leave when you want it. And the transportation would be depending. So if it's just a couple, we would use, um, you know, just a a car, a sedan with a driver, uh, or you could self-drive if you wanted to. And if it was a larger group, we use a minivan or, you know, depending on what you, your needs were. Uh, another question that we have, and I think this is a little bit difficult to answer in light of COVID, but perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about what's your ideal time of year to travel to the Basque country and the wine region? Sure, absolutely. So I think May and June, not of this year, um, but May and June um, are great times and then the fall as well. If you go in the fall, you might be able to cut some of the, um, some of the, when they're collecting the, the grapes and stuff. And that's really fun to see. In some places it would actually let us um, allow you to participate. Now with COVID they don't allow it, but you know, thinking of the future, you can even participate in pressing the grapes and stuff like that, which is a lot of fun. Um, but so May, June, September, October would be my foremost months. If you go in April, it might be a little bit too chilly still uh, in the north of Spain. And uh, yeah. And maybe you could just spend a moment or two. I think we've got probably a lot of folks that are on the, um, on our event today that maybe have done wine tasting in California or other regions of the world. And it seems to vary from country to country. Could you just tell us what a typical wine tasting would be like and the, and the duration of the visit? Right, so I think, you know, we spend typically about a one to two hours in each winery. And 
the wineries that we pick, even though some of them are big names that are all, you know, craft wineries or they're family owned. So typically you would have a member of the family walking with you and showing you and explaining, you know, what makes them really excited about their wine. So it's very intimate um, sort of visit in, and then, you know, you, they go to show you the barrels and their favorite barrels and how, you know, it's like sometimes they'll have barrels that were signed by different kings or, or you know, famous people like, you know, there'll be a barrel signed by Paul McCartney or something like that. So, so those, those they save, you know, they do it with chalk and they save those and stuff. So it's, it's always very intimate and uh, it's very different than the wine tasting I've done in, in California, for example. How many wines might you taste? Would it be, uh, you know, a full flight or uh, just a couple focusing more attention on the individual wines? So depending on the winery, so some wineries are, they're really specific about what they make. So if they only make, you know, say the Rioja, you might try a different, you know, just a half a flight of different uh, sort of ages, right? Like a Reserva, a Tempranillo, somewhere in the middle, a Gran Reserva, things like that. But then if you do, some winers do deviate, like for example, in, in Southern Spain, because um, you use sherry wine and the barrels from sherry wine to also create brandy, then you, <laughs> then you better eat a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the tapas that they give you because you're, you'll start with five, six, seven different types of sherry wine and then you move on to the brandies and then by the end you better eat a lot of cheese and hamon. Excellent. Good to have a car and driver too. <laughs> <laughs> And I think if you could touch on a, a little bit as well, which, which you did in the presentation, that you and your team helps the travel advisors at Dimensions and Travel talk about the winery visits and perhaps they have a particular interest in one type of wine and you know there, there's an ability to focus on that too. Yeah, absolutely. So because we, um, one, only work for travel advisors. So we create, you know, the best itinerary or the, you know, including, it's very customized. So including the people's favorites, uh, whether it's wine or anything, what it's culture, um, whether some people are more interested in the, you know, here we saw a lot of the history together with the wine, but some people might be more interested in, in not so interested in architecture, but they're more interested in painting. Um, some might want to see, only red wines or, you know, because they, they might have an interest or may, there might be a wine club that specializes in, in that. So we always, uh, we, we don't do two itineraries that are the same. So we always create very specific to people's interests. Jesus, I remember you had helped me with a couple whose um, granddaughter was on a soccer team and they were playing in San Sebastian and they flew over with the family. And in between soccer matches, you helped to coordinate visits to different wineries and Pinchos tours built around the family's interest in soccer. Uh, and so it was just a perfect blend, I think, for the family. Right, and another, another times that we have to do a lot of blending is when you have uh, multi-generation. Um, which, you know, so you know, the adults might be interested in, in one thing, but then obviously the kids are not wine tasting. So we got to, you know, we come up with things for the kids to do so that they, everybody's happy and entertained. So oh. is the Rioja region the name of, a, of, of an area? Uh, and then Chacoli is, is a microclimate within that. Can you differentiate that? Sure. So they're all different, you know, what we call appellations. So each region, you know, kind of like how like you can't call champagne out of that's being made out of the Champagne area champagne. It has to be Cava in Spain or Prosecco in Italy. So in, in Europe, each wine region is very well defined. So La Rioja is a region and only wine produced there. So it's underneath the Basque country. So only wine produced there, you could produce a red wine in Southern Spain, but you cannot call it Rioja. Okay. So it has to come from there. So, and then Chacoli, uh, it's also an appellation and it's, it's right around San Sebastian. So it's, it's in the midst of the Basque country. 
Well, I think that's all we have for, for questions and lots of nice comments of, of thanks for introducing everyone today to this beautiful part of Spain. Thank you so much, Jesus, and thank you everyone for joining. Diana, any last comments? Yes, uh, we would love to have Jesus back to do some more mm -hmm. uh, talks with us on Spain. So if any of our listeners have some ideas or places that you'd like to learn more about in Spain, uh, please let us know. Um, we consider Jesus to be such an incredible resource for us. And if you'd like to reach out to us on an individual basis and let us know about an idea you have, uh, maybe you don't have dates yet, but you've got an idea cooking, Please reach out to us. Our contact information is there with our 800 number as well as our email. And we can get started on dreaming a trip to Spain or Portugal for you. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we appreciate, thank you Jesus for your time. I know you're uh, under a couple of feet of snow back on the East Coast mm -hmm. and um, we're grateful you were able to join in with us today. I am too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us and um, we'll see you on our next adventure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye everybody.